morning of worship so far. We'll do some house cleaning here. There would be some who would ask if I actually know how to do that. But I don't want to get too confused with a few things up here today. The, today we're going to be looking at the time as uh, Moses uh, is gone back to Egypt to free them. Uh, to this passage that we're reading today, what has taken place is there have been nine plagues that have devastated Egypt. Each plague with the intent from God so that the Pharaoh would let his people go. But time and time again, he refuses to let them go. Time and time again, he makes it so they have to go through something even more than that that has already taken place so that Israel could be free of their captor. The Passover was more than the 10th plague. It was a test and a teaching, to, teaching tool to all mankind. The day as we look over, we're going to look and read about the Passover. We're going to close uh, my message out with us taking communion. If you do not have a communion cup, would you please raise your hand now so we could get one to you? All right, everyone. And my wife peeled off the top for me already, so when it comes to that time, I will be ready. God hardened Pharaoh's heart with power. Pharaoh viewed himself as a god. How could he let a bigger god tell him what to do? This is pride. We all have it. We all <clears throat> can find ourselves its slave, especially if we don't humble ourselves by putting God in his right place in our lives. The only way we could deal with our pride is if we understand that God is over us and we're living for him. Because anytime we're outside of that, we're going to be living for self. We're going to be living to build ourselves up, make ourselves look good, instead of making ourselves be who God wants us to be. It's something we can all struggle with. Pharaoh and his people believed him to be a god, with a little g. The only problem was the god with the big g was the one he was dealing with. But you see, he didn't see the difference between the G's. He only believed himself to be God. And he believed it was his responsibility to keep Israel in their place for his people of Egypt. Pharaoh keeps pushing back after the pain. With each plague, it becomes clear that the Pharaoh does not have complete control. There's something bigger than him at work. But time and time again, his, his hard heart, filled with pride, won't let go of Israel. Have you ever had one of those moments in your life where there's nothing is going to make you give up, stop, or whatever? You, you're going to come against this person, you're going to stand up to this person, you're going to prove yourself, you're going to make sure they know who you are, they understand the fortitude and the strong will you have. How many here today were raised, when going gets tough, the tough get going? Right? Now, work ethic and, 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 and being strong and, and staying tough in hard circumstances is great and something I think something that has made America great is is that spirit. But the problem is is when that is what leads and guides us in everything, it becomes selfish. But when we're like that because it, we're seeking to be who and what God wants us to be, when we're taking a stand for God and not for ourselves, that's when we're in the right place. Pharaoh was not in that place. He did not want to lose. He was down 100 to 1. And he wanted to keep fighting on. And the problem is, in our lives when we get like that, 
it brings destruction. The tenth plague of death to the eldest. This could be hard uh, for people when they, when they see something like this in Scripture. They could be, well, how could God do this? And, and how could this take place? And I think as we read the passage, I hope you'll, you'll see and understand. There's a point where, where God says when he comes with the death angel, when it comes, it is not just I'm coming to kill because you won't let my people go. It's God's just judgment coming forth. It's his judgment coming upon those who do not go through the process of Passover to be passed over. And so when we look at it, it can be difficult to see this, but what God is trying to explain to you, this is justice playing out, and we're all going to have to deal with it. The tenth plague would require obedience of the Passover for the angel of death to pass over their household. They would put, they would take in a lamb into their home at the beginning of the month. A perfect, clean, pure lamb. And they would take care of it. And they keep it in their house so it would get no, no, no scuffs, no scrapes, and no scratches. So it would be without blemish. And then at the time for the Passover, they come and they would, they would kill the lamb. And they would take the blood that bleeds out of it and they put it on their doorposts as a sign. It required a sacrifice for death to pass over. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided <coughs> Divided in portion to the numbers of the people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Amen. A year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assemb assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it. At twilight, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head legs, and inner organs, you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. I'm good at that. It is the Passover of the Lord, for I will pass <clears throat> through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human being and animals, on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be <clears throat> assigned for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. 
You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe it as a <clears throat> perpetual ordinance. Why death as the last plague? Death is the result of not living for God, which is sin. From the fall, death had, its fi had the final word. This is part of the teaching to all of us. The cost of separation from God is death. Whatever separates us from God is sin and leads to death. You see, sin requires payment, and that payment is death. This is why the clean lamb must be killed and bled out, so the blood can be placed on the door and the lentil of the household. God requires obedience for the Passover. God requires for all the steps to take place because it shows the commitment to and reliance on him and his way. The Passover. Now think about this. As Egypt has been going through these plagues, the congregation of Israel, God's people, have been uninfected by the plagues. Now remember, they're, essentially they went from being sojourners, living a, a good life in a foreign land, being a part of the community and, and, and everything that was going on there, and then they were taken in and they were made slaves. They were made to, to do more work each and every day. And then they were made to do that same work without some of the materials they needed to do that work. Their male, their male offspring were targeted for death because the Pharaoh feared them. And as this last play comes... They're given this ritual way of, of having a meal that is the Passover. That we can see now the representations of each and every part of it. That God is calling them to go through these steps, to connect with this lamb, to have a relationship with it, to feed and water it, it doesn't take long for a pet to be in the house for the kids to fall in love with it. Just think how your five-year-old would have been enjoying the meal of the lamb that they just watched be slaughtered and have its blood splashed on the door. Think of the weight of all of that taking place. But we must remember the importance of it. All the hardship that Egypt had caused because of the Pharaoh. God was bringing that judgment upon them. And he would only pass over if the blood from a clean lamb was on the door post of the home. And he would pass by. Every other household would be affected. You see, the Passover is an ordinance of God. It is worship, not done out of duty, but done out of appreciation for what God has done and is doing and bringing us freedom from our oppressor sin. Hundreds of years from that moment, Jesus will use that ordinance to bring salvation to the world because he 
will be the final lamb that will be sacrificed. He will be the final payment to sin. Not because we deserve him, not because we have earned it, not because we're good at heart, but because God loves us and wants us to be free to be in a relationship with him. So when we worship, it is not done out of duty, but it is done out of appreciation and praise. Jesus chose the Passover to reveal the new covenant of Holy Communion. We must eat the bread and drink the cup. It means we must know and understand our righteousness is in Christ alone. It is, it is his life as the lamb and sacrifice on the cross, followed by his resurrection that makes us right with God. It is because he is Christ that we follow him and worship him today. As we take communion this morning, go ahead and get your, your cup ready. And I want, to th- want you to think about what was going on. Jesus has a betrayer in the room. He knows it and he loves him. He washes his feet. He eats with them. The holiest of meals in Israel. He has his other 11 disciples there, and they even have to ask, which one is it that betrays you when he brings it up? They're going through a meal that God has orchestrated from the beginning of time. The Last Supper the last time that Jesus would eat bread and drink of a cup before he was sacrificed on the altar of the cross. The last meal with his closest of followers before he is whipped, spat on, and humiliated. His last meal before he makes the final payment for my sin and for yours. He's there with his disciples. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 through 27, this is what it reads. For I received from the Lord what I also <clears throat> passed on to you, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord.
That last passage, what it means is if you eat this bread as just a piece of bread, if you eat this bread because you feel like you have done enough to deserve it, if you eat this bread without humility and a broken heart, you have sinned. Because this bread is the Son of God broken for you. And when we accept that and we understand that, we are doing it in remembrance of who he is and what he has done for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you praise for this element. Lord, we do not take it out of duty. But we take it out of appreciation that you would send your son. That he willingly would leave heaven to come to earth. So that he could die for me. Who is most unworthy. Lord, may we be humble each and every day and remember what you have done for us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, as we drink this cup, may we understand the sacrifice that was made. The shedding of blood one last time so that I, so that we to be free of our brokenness. And not only free from our brokenness, but free from death. That this cup represents our eternity with you, Father. That we can worship you. That we can humbly come before you. That we are righteous because he shed his blood for us and it has washed away our sins. Lord, we give you praise for this. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Worship team, will you come as we close with the final song today?